Hi, everybody. Are we having a great time? I, I, before I, I ask Sheldon some questions, I want to make something clear about what Sheldon really represents. And I want to ask you to repeat after me. Hine matov umanayim shevet achim gam yachad. Isn't it a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing, when brothers and sisters are together in unity? That is Sheldon's miracle. This is a man who needs to be understood because he is not always well understood. There was an article this morning that was basically an attack on the IAC, and it said something truly absurd. It said that the IAC and Sheldon only have one direction, and that's to the right. And I got to say that whoever wrote that article didn't see this group, because this group is made up of Jews. And guess what? How diverse are Jews? How different are Jews? I heard about a session that happened yesterday morning where a person who was kind of leaning just maybe a bit to the right and an MK who was leaning just a bit to the left. And I, I heard that the person who was leaning just a bit to the left got most of the applause. Now, what that says is that that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are diverse. But there is one part of this. This diversity in this room and the networks of diversity that Sheldon helped to create at Birthright. What that means is that that diversity speaks to each other with love and civility. These are networks of love that tie everyone in this room together. And the truth is that without love, left and right could tear us to pieces and apart and destroy us. But with love, we will have civility, we will have conversation, we will have the ability ultimately to transcend our enemies whose words are generally words of hate. And that can only be countered by words of affection and love and the ties that tie us all together. And if you look at the IA, go ahead, you can applaud. And if you look at the IAC, and if you look at Birthright, two of the programs that I understand the best that Sheldon's involved in, in fact, where Sheldon was part of the seed money to make two of our most important Jewish startups happen, then you see that what they're really about is actually not about increasing political support for anything. It's about creating networks of love and affection that tie us all together, Jews in America and Jews in Israel, and none of that is truly political. All of that is about what helps us survive. So uh, I'm not a good interviewer because it's no surprise that I love Sheldon. And uh, it's basically because of what I just said and because my life, my life has been about Jewish identity and what ties us together. And I can't think of two programs that are more important to assuring the future of the Jewish people. It's not political, not political at all. It's really about what the Jewish people are and what we stand for and where we will go together as a people. So I'm going to start with a question that has nothing to do with any of that. Uh, people seem to think that the only thing you care about, though I think it's most important, are those issues. But the truth is that, that there are other things that are important to you as well and that you're funding millions and millions and millions of dollars of important medical research. Could you tell us a little bit about what philosophy drives you and how that's structured? About the medical research, it's, uh, we just put out a press release talking about the thousandth article that has been written by the group of researchers with whom we work. Uh, I established a, a model, uh, bis I call it a business model, of uh, collaborative uh, research, which some of the researchers have suggested has fundamentally changed the way medical research is conducted. Uh, when I wanted to uh, uh, pay back my neurologist who helped me with my peripheral neuropathy problem. I knew that he was a, uh, he was a 
deep down researcher and so i asked him if he would like me to finance some research well i went around did some due diligence on the subject of uh, of uh, medical research and what i've learned was that the two that medical research findings are held up because of two issues. Number one is money. Number two is the willingness of scientists to collaborate with one another. So I worked out a collaborative program. Everybody, every philanthropist identifies one or more laboratories with the scientists and they finance the one laboratory that comes up with one idea. My idea is to get five, six, seven, eight scientists with different opinions, typically the more well-known of the scientists, and put them all together and let them determine uh, all we do, my wife and I as trustees, all we do is name the disease. <laughs> and uh, they decide who is going to study, and it will typically have a, uh, a scientist from Weizmann Institute, uh, somebody from the Technion, uh, somebody from uh, Stanford in Palo Alto, somebody from uh, 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 Sloan Kettering in New York, etc. And each one of those scientists will get together and they'll decide what they want to study. So the best of the ideas of the most well-known scientists in that field will contribute it, put it in a pot, and let them all decide what they want to study. And I'm very happy to say that we have, we've been doing this since 1906 with a slight uh, uh, hiatus during the recession. 2000s. Two th what did I say? 1906. Oh, sorry, I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm old, but not that old. Um, 2006, and um, we have now I'll just put out a press release. We have now accomplished um, the submission of 1,000 professional articles that have been published in professional journals. We also have 24 treatments that are under clinical trials. And we have uh, uh, another large amount that are, that are in the process of going to clinical trials. Uh, a recent finding from uh, two scientists, one at University of Pennsylvania at Penn and the other at Johns Hopkins, that identifies most minute, sing I'll call it single cell, although I'm not sure that's the case, maybe a, a small handful of cells, uh, for four cancers, for ovarian, for colorectal, for lung, and for brain, and uh, that have not been done before, that were not traceable to by the normal diagnostic imaging. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, and I hope we have some good findings to leave as my legacy. Amazing. Of course, of course, it, uh, it 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 helps that you have a person who's both a, a, a doctor and a scientist uh, and a brilliant woman of note at your side. So that probably helps a great deal too. Beside being my best friend and a great wife <laughs> and mother. <laughs> I've got to have uh, got to ask our daughter if the last comment was right. So I would say um, um, I, I can't resist a, a word of Torah whenever I'm speaking. So I would just say that uh, uh, last week in Lech Lecha, uh, God promises uh, Abraham that his role is to be a blessing to the whole world. And if we can accomplish even like 10% of what you just described, the world will know what a blessing the Adelson family and the Jewish people are to the whole world. Thank you. So, so uh, ever, ever since I've, I've known you, which is about 30 years now, uh, it, it's been clear that- Time goes fast when you're having fun. <laughs> exactly, who has more fun than me? Uh, 
there is one requirement for my job, which is you've got to love the Jewish people. If you don't love that, I suggest a different career uh, than uh, being a Federation executive. Um, ever since I've known you, though, it's been clear that while you have passion for every person who comes up to you, every Birthright alum and says, you've changed my life, that you're always shooting for something bigger, and you've always had the perception that Birthright and um, the IAC could in some serious way change the dynamics of Jewish life in America and around the world. In other words, that it could change the world. So what, what gave you and Miri the guts to take on huge problems which could easily fail and work toward the implementation of very large solutions to very large problems? Well, I trace it back to my uh, uh, younger days when I didn't have anything to lose, so I took big chances. And uh, good things happened out of it. And so I'm taking the chances now. I'm uh, running headlong into these challenges. And um, I think with the IAC, the most important thing is that everybody is part of a hidden secret community that they don't know anything about. And as we could tell from the attendance here at, the, at this uh, conference, that uh, I see more new and new, newer faces coming here than last year and the year before. And um, I think everybody feels part of a community. And that's what was lacking before. The is uh, Israeli Americans were ostracized by the Israelis and the Israeli government that didn't want to see the, what's the word, Yodim, they didn't want to see them leaving the country. I discussed it with uh, uh, Netanyahu, and he said, that was in the past. We welcome a relationship with them now. And um, they're no longer looked down at. They're considered an asset for the state of Israel and as my wife Mary says, uh, they're considered ambassadors and soldiers on the front line. So if and when, God forbid, Israel needs to get help from here in the United States, that we have a lot of soldiers out here that are willing to go and fight to contact their congressmen and senators and the administration to fight. As I said yesterday, they're unequivocal meaning that there's no question in their mind. They won't take politics or partisanship into consideration. They all say, we love Israel. I, I told my friends in Israel that they don't really understand when you come to the States and you see the people that are here, they haven't converted s totally into being American although they feel very strong Americans, they have increased their love. There isn't one Israeli American I know that in times of trouble, that one rush to get on next plane to go over to Israel to do what they can to help. I think that's the, I think that's the essence of what we're all working you know, so hard uh, to create, which is a next generation of uh, Israeli Americans and a next generation of American Jews who feel that sense, if nothing else, a sense of love and commitment and responsibility for um, uh, helping and supporting the Jewish people worldwide. And I don't think anybody represents that any better than you or the IAC, so it's appreciated. Well, what I wanted to f uh, finish, that uh, the Israeli Americans were ostracized by Israel and they didn't reach out to be accepted by the American Jewish community. So there's like two entities and two communities. Now it's, it's coming the other way. The American Jewish community is affiliating with the IAC and they want to feel part of this. As Abraham Minfeld said, I think it was Friday night at his very exciting and, and electric lecture, uh, he talked about everybody being one people. We are a Jewish people, we're mishpacha, we are one family. And whether we're politically to left, right, center, whatever, 
we're one family we have one home and we all auto advocate for that home unequivocally um, the um I think what's interesting to me, we are uh, said probably with too much uh, charity that uh, Boston has the best relationship between uh, the IAC and the and the Federation, and that's because of you, uh, Barry. Actually, I would I would have to say, I mean, the 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 trick is that there's, it's been very difficult for federations to reach out to the Israeli community for many of the reasons that you cited. The difference here really is the passion of the IAC and their understanding that having that kind of relationship is important for the American, for the Israeli American community. It really was the power of the local chapter in Boston and it's the idea of the IAC that makes it possible. All that's left is for the Federation in a community to open the door and understand the miracle and the great gift that they're getting but you really do have to give credit to the idea of the IAC, the creation of the IAC, and basically the underlying idea that we really do need to get work together uh, if we're gonna survive as Jews in this country. So we will either all rise together or fall together, but the IAC will make it much more possible for us to rise together. I wanted to give them credit, but they prefer to have cash. <laughs> I wanted to give them credit, but they prefer to have cash. Look, the, the, uh, the federations, and I'm a big believer, I've been for many, many years in the federation system. The problem is that the old timers in the federations want to keep things the way they are. I remember the days when uh, Operation Solomon, when the Ethiopians first were released, many years ago, and the percentage of money raised by the federations went to the Sachnu, to the Jewish agency, to the extent of 35% to keep Jewish agency and Olim alive. Today, what, keeps, what will keep the federations alive and be active in the future is something called birthright. The birthright organization gets less than 1% of the total amount of money that's raised by all the federations combined. They raise over $900 million and they get, give or take, $6 million. Now, there are a lot of individual givers that I've talked to lately that will give $5 million or more. And the federations, if they want membership in the future, where does it lie? It lies in birthright. Without birthright, our future is at risk. And um, uh, you take, uh, I don't know if Len Sachs from Brandeis is still here, but his surveys show very clearly, and I'll just use some general numbers, that only 42% of Jewish youngsters between 18 and 26 say they intend to marry within the religion and or bring their children up Jewish. For the kids that go on birthright, that figure jumps to 76%. Beside the IAC that is creating a community, we need the youngsters to go out there. Every parent doesn't have to you know, they're not PhDs in passing on their beliefs to their children. Uh, I feel very happy we passed our beliefs on to our children. At least we hope they'll, several of them will, uh, will follow through. Um, sometimes fun gets in the way. Um, but without, without birthright, where are we going to be in two generations? Well, you know, I, I think that there are two. So I've been, um, I've been working for the Jewish community since 1970. Um, that's 47 years. And I've been obsessed with questions of Jewish identity. Many people 
will tell you, too obsessed with issues of Jewish identity. But this is perfectly clear. We've understood from the beginning, from the first studies, that Jewish education is super important, but not all by itself, particularly when so many parts of the Jewish education system, for example, many of the Hebrew schools are so weak. So therefore, you've got to figure out why is that and what needs to be done. The answer to that is that the ethnic connections that used to pull us all together, the love that we had for each other in our little ethnic neighborhoods, those are all gone. What will actually provide this sense of connection and love of the Jewish people? Especially your understanding that 50% of our children are being raised in interfaith households where only half of their family connections are Jewish. Nevertheless, we're deeply committed to reaching out to the children of interfaith households and to interfaith households because what Birthright shows is that change is possible. In other words, what, they, what, what Birthright does is that all those numbers that you gave, it's way lower for the children of intermarriage. On the other hand, a birthright experience drives it up to where it's almost at the same level and even beyond the level of the children of in-married families. So birthright touches so many things because it's based on the idea that when those kids meet those Israeli soldiers, that something profound changes in their souls. And I'll tell you something else. Something profound changes in the souls of those soldiers as well, who all of a sudden understand their responsibility for their land is also their responsibility for all their lovely brothers and sisters on that bus. And once again, uh, uh, all in all, what we really have to understand is how important it is for brothers and sisters to sit together in unity, love, and affection, and caring. And I think that in some way is the, uh, um, the central point of everything that you've done and everything that you've been able to stand for. And if we can figure out how to carry that forward, uh, our big thing in Boston is birthright follow-up as well. We don't think birthright's got responsibility to do that. We think any community that doesn't follow up with the kids coming back must be s something wrong because why would you not look for the people who are potentially the most committed part of the next generation and not give them Jewish education and learning and bring them in and, and educate and engage? Every federation ought to be doing that as well as fully supporting birthright because in this struggle, we don't have a ton of tools. I would love for every single kid to go to day school. Love it. All my kids do, and we're deeply committed to our day schools. But before that, you have to have parents who actually feel deeply committed to the Jewish people and kids who feel deeply committed to the Jewish people. And birthright's one of the few ways that you're going to actually make that happen. You look at the alternative and you say uh, that we're down to 42 percent. Now that, if we don't, if birthright wasn't there, that number would keep going down, and it's not difficult to see that secular Jews will only last another two, maybe three generations, and then we're all gone. Only the Orthodox Jews will be left. Now the Orthodox Jews, the Charedim have uh, saved Judaism for 2,000 years. Without them, there won't be any, any Jewish family today. So I, <laughs> even though I'm secular, I don't want to see the secular people disappear. I want my, my purpose of being in, Miriam and my purpose being involved in his birthright is what you are an expert at, Jewish continuity. Uh, we want the, the I've, I've used the word nobility. I think that the most noble thing an adult mature Jew should, can do is to be the, the mason that mixes the cement that ties two generations together. I, I, I couldn't ag agree more, but I will disagree mildly on one thing that you said. So uh, to, um, to remember what Rob Cook understood so well, it was the secular Jews that were building the state of Israel at the beginning, and there's great pride that could be taken in that. Second thing I feel is that if there's a problem spiritually in Israel, it's drawing too hard a line between what is secular and what is religious. One of the things we've got in the United States is that, you know what, you can decide what Shabbat means to you, uh, or what being what you ought to put in your mouth and eat, you can decide that on your own. 
but at the end at the end of the day you're still going to be a person who's going to be going to a synagogue and believing that however they want to define it that's what it might mean to be religious the line between secular and religious is much more fluid in the united states and in part because of what i would consider to be the not too terrific aspects of the rabbanut it, it ends up becoming a story of conflict instead of again a story of love so we need all of you secular religious we need all of you to be part of this thing that binds us all together and that's so important to you and miri well uh, you were t you're talking about the modern uh the modern history what's happening since the founding of the state of israel in 1948 i'm talking about historically but we're both right we're both right <laughs> i certainly agree with that um, so one uh, one um, uh, final question, which is, um, what what will success look like for the American Jewish and Israeli American Jewish community in 25 years? In a few words, just tell us what your best dream is for our future. I think the Israeli American community will be the seed that will grow our future. Uh, the tree of life will be fed and nourished by the Israeli-American group. Uh, I see the generations passing. The, my parents' generation, uh, they came to this country to escape the pogroms. <clears throat> so the survival of the Jewish people was very much on their mind. My father always dreamt that there would be a place like the United States that welcomed the Jews as first-class citizens and that we would be assimilating. Now, the word assimilation, it, it, it uh, co-founded with, uh, with uh, intermarriage uh, is what's causing our undoing, but that's another issue. Generations like mine adopted the feelings of the parents because they were so strong. Generations, new generations, adolescents, youngsters, by the way, uh, Birthright's going to uh, address another category of ages from 27 to 32. Uh, they'll be. Uh, applause, because that's going to make a huge difference, giant difference. Uh, we're jokingly calling it birthright marriage. Well, you know, you're, you're a great man, Sheldon, but, you know, when you can figure that out, you can let me know. Well, I tell you, kids at that age that I'm married, they're looking for mates. So <laughs> it, could be, it could be a much higher percentage of kids on birthright getting getting, uh, I don't want to say hooked up, but getting married. Oh, I do want to say hooked up. <laughs> um, so so my, my dream is that th this contagion of loving Israel and knowing that you're part of a worldwide family will spread and become contagious for future generations. That'll be easy to bring up young people today to care about the history of the Jewish people and to care about our future. That's what I hope the future will be. Beautiful like. dream, Sheldon. Beautiful dream. Um, so uh, uh, just to say that again, he name atovum anayim shevarachim gam yachad. And what does that mean to me? Uh, it means that, um, look, many of the people in this room already have uh, grandchildren and children who are the children and grandchildren of intermarried people. We believe that the beauty of our tradition in an open world will be attractive to all of them. And we believe that the diversity in this room will mark the future of our Jewish people and create something beautiful. And we believe that the important part of your legacy is not necessarily the political parts of your involvement, though those certainly have meaning as well, but it's this thing that you're building, this network of love and affection that binds Jews together. And you have invested 
a huge amount of your resource to do that. So I think sometimes about um, how you got to this place and why you got to this place. And of course, I know it's your tireless uh, energy and business acumen, but you know I'm a religious Jew, so I sort of think that there may be other aspects of this. And I think it's best summed up by Mordecai's uh, statement to uh, Esther when he urges her to save the Jewish people, and he says, who knows, but perhaps God has placed you in the royal position for exactly this purpose and exactly this moment. Um, I think that's your job, Sheldon, and I think you've done it very well. Thank you. Thank you all.